Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, the victorious Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The High Priestly Prayer. This is what our gospel reading for today is often called, or at least this is part of our gospel reading is part of this prayer. You really should go and read all of John chapter 17. It is your Lord praying for you, praying for his disciples. And actually, in the verse right after our reading today, verse 20, he says that all these things that he's talking about for his disciples, his 12, are also for you. With Jesus as our high priest, what exactly does that mean? Well, if you know in the Old Testament, that was an office held by Aaron and then his descendants, that there was one high priest of Israel. And the high priest's main function, he had a lot of duties and tasks, but his main function was to be the person that would speak on behalf of the people to God and on behalf of God to the people. He was his mouthpiece both ways, so to speak. And pastors continue that tradition today. You may notice that sometimes in the service... I turn away from you and face the altar. I'm not ignoring you, right? What I'm doing is I'm speaking to God on your behalf. Right? When we do the prayers of the church, it really is the church speaking the prayers to God. So Jesus is now our high priest in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, with the promise of the gospel. And in our gospel reading today, we get to see a little bit of what he prays about on our behalf. In the world, but not of the world. Have you heard that phrase before? That phrase is often used to describe us, describe Christians. And here in the prayer, Jesus is talking about this phenomenon. The context of John chapter 17 is Jesus has just given his final instructions that he's going to give to his disciples before he goes to Jerusalem and what awaits him there, the cross and the tomb. And so as he gives his final instructions to his disciples, and as he sets his face towards Jerusalem, and he knows what's going to happen there, he prays on their behalf because he's no longer going to be with them in the same manner in which he has been for the last three years. And this phrase sums it up, in the world but not of the world. That phrase describes the reality of what it means to be called by God, to be called by His Word, as we'll get into here in a moment. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know the reality that this speaks to. The world around you often asks you to believe, to say, to do things that our Lord says to not do. And then we live in that tension, and that reality then becomes clear that while we are still here in the world, we're no longer of it. We've been made new in Jesus. Another phrase that describes this reality that you may have heard is that we're two kingdom people. I had a professor at the seminary who would very gregariously illustrate this by standing on two desks. He'd say, you have one foot in the kingdom of heaven and one foot in the kingdom of earth. And we're going to get into why exactly did God set things up this way? Why after Jesus accomplished salvation and we become his children, fully redeemed children of God, why are we still in the world but not of it? Well, our Lord Jesus is praying about this very reality today. And... He is praying that our Heavenly Father would protect us from the evil one while we remain here. So, not of the world. Why? What happened? Well, it's important to note here what we mean when we say world. That has a lot of different meanings. It could mean literally the planet Earth, but in this it says that the world hates us, so that wouldn't make any sense that a an animate block of minerals hates us. But there are many ways that this can be translated. And so we translate a word like this. In Greek, it's cosmos, where we get our word cosmos from. 
we interpret those sorts of words by context. And so what the context here tells us is that the world here is in reference to the gathering of the ungodly or the multitude of unbelievers. The spirit of this world apart from Christ. That is what we mean when we say the world, those who have fallen, who live in this fallen and corrupt world and are succumbed to it. And you and I, just like the original disciples, Jesus tells us in this prayer that we have been called out of the world. We're no longer a part of the group of unbelievers, but now by the gracious gift of faith, we belong to God. We're now a people made for a different place. Now, the 12 disciples, that word of God that called them out of the world was follow me. Jesus came to them and found them and said, follow me, and they left everything and followed him. And guess what? It's that very same word that called you out of the world. It wasn't Jesus walking on the shore of Galilee, literally speaking the words, follow me to you, but sending his word out through his apostles, down through the generations, through the church, until it met you or your parents or your grandparents or your great, 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 all the way back. And you are called out of the world by that word. But here's the rub. I'm fully redeemed child of God. You're a fully redeemed child of God. We're good to go in the eternal sense. So why this in the world but not of the world business? Right? Even in the prayer today, he specifically says he's not asking the Father to remove us from the world even though maybe at sometimes that's what we would like. This was something that Luther noticed and took issue with with the church in his time, as they were always preaching and talking about the way that you live a life pleasing to God is by separating yourself from the world, by dedicating your life to the church and godly matters and leaving the mundane behind. And here, as he notes, Jesus is not calling us to that. That we're not meant to leave the world behind, at least not yet, because he's not calling the Father to take us out of the world. So in one sense, you and I, we're no longer people of this world. Here he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Right? If you remember a few weeks back, when he was talking to Pilate and he mentions that his kingdom is not of this world. That's the kingdom to which you and I now belong through the gracious work of Jesus. By God's word, we have been called out of the world. We now believe by God's word and know that Jesus was sent from the Father. In fact, if you go back into the first part of John chapter 17, that's how this whole prayer begins is that he's praying on behalf of those who believe that he has come from the Father. And they believe the message of salvation that he has brought to them. Salvation through his death and resurrection. They believe, just as we do, that they are already a new creation. No longer dead in their trespasses and sins as those of the world are, but now children of God made new, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, born again to the promise of everlasting life. Yet we remain here. Why? Well, there are two concerns that Jesus addresses to this new reality that you and I live in, a people of two kingdoms in the world and not of the world. The first is how do we actually remain in it? If you've ever been in tension before, it's not the most comfortable place to be, right? It wears you down. How are we to remain living in a state like that? How is it not going to just grind us down into nothing until we fall away? How can we stand it? That's the first thing he addresses. The second thing he addresses is, is the all-important question of purpose. Why are we still here? 
If salvation has been accomplished in Jesus and we're perfectly redeemed children of God just awaiting the great day of the Lord, why isn't that already here? At least for us, God's certainly capable of doing that. So first we'll look at how are we able to remain. In the same verse where Jesus says he isn't asking the Father to take us out of the world, he ends it with this phrase, that you keep them from the evil one. This tells us that while God is not calling us out of the sinful and fallen world, that he's leaving us in this state of tension of being in two kingdoms, that he's not leaving us alone, that he's providing spiritual protection for us, that he's asking this on behalf of us of the Father. After all, that's our real opponent here in this world. It's not other people, but the spiritual forces of darkness at play here in our world. In other words, we're not left to fend for ourselves. You aren't alone. God sends His Holy Spirit to watch over you, to sustain you, to uplift you. What we're gathering around this morning is, in fact, the means of grace by which the Spirit of God is brought to bear in our lives through God's Word And then by extension, his sacraments, gifts meant to sustain us in that that tension that grinds us down. The blessed words of forgiveness after we confess our sin that weighs on our conscience week in and week out, fully relieved by the words of God, I forgive you all of your sins. The second part of how will we be able to endure is in verse 17. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. There are multiple ways God protects us from the evil one. One is in his abiding presence through the Holy Spirit, and the other one is through his word. Think about it. Where do you turn for assurance when that state of living in tension with this world has ground you down, when you're feeling down about your own worth and your own salvation? We turn to the promises of God's word. We turn to the certain and future hope we we have in this new world we belong to, the kingdom of God by which we now are citizens according to the graces and mercies of Jesus. But what does that look like in real life? What does that concept look like to us? Have you ever been to a Christian funeral? The revelation of God's victory over death is comfort during the trials of that are a result of sin in this world. Part of the corrupt and fallen nature of the world is death. And it threatens to grind us down, to make us lose hope and despair. And into those moments bursts God's Word and His Holy Spirit with the gracious promise of salvation in Jesus, that He has overcome that. In real life, it looks like things like abortion and all the other sorts of beliefs the world has that the church rejects. The world tempts us to condone it, to rationalize it, to explain it away. Not only that, the world tempts us on both sides. It tempts us to hate those who have fallen prey to this sin and the others that our world peddles as good. It tempts us to view them with hatred rather than compassion. It tempts us to rationalize and soften the recklessness of such sins. Love. The world tempts us to think that this is whatever makes us feel good. That letting others that we love live however they wish to with no regard to the way God feels about it and what He calls good. Yet in Jesus, we've been called to something different. The same sort of love that he had for us. Jesus wasn't sitting up in heaven saying, you do you, bro. Whatever makes you happy. Because he knew where our path was taking us. Away from him. Away from life. And so what did he do? He interceded for us. We didn't ask Jesus to come. He came out of his love, right? For God so loved the world. The list goes on and on. But how are we sustained as we navigate all these conflicts, 
and others between what God has called us to do and the world's inclinations and whisperings and temptations. We're sustained by God's presence and through the revelation of his word. We cling to it when those waves of the world threaten to confuse us and overwhelm us. But even with the ability to remain in the world, the question still remains, why? What is the purpose? Why must we remain in the world if Jesus has won everything? Well, Jesus answers this question as well towards the end of the prayer. In verse 18, he says this, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Think about that for a moment. Those of you who think that you are of no consequence or that your life isn't that important. As you sent me, this is Jesus talking to the Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. God is using you to bring his word of life and freedom and light to bear into this world ensnared by darkness, the world that you're no longer a part of, that you have been called out of, that you have been set free from, yet still we remain living in. It isn't for our own sake. It isn't some masochistic dream about living in tension. It is for the purpose of freeing others by sharing the very thing which frees us, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is sending his 12 disciples here in John chapter 17, but the very next verse indicates that this is for all of those who believe in him. Now, you may not be being sent to India or to the Gentile nations like Paul. Maybe it's just to a school or a law office or a doctor's office. Maybe it's your home or your neighborhood. Don't be fooled. There are people there ensnared in the darkness of this world, who need the very same light which you received from Christ, and that is why you are still here. That is why I am still here. Even though we are fully redeemed children of God, our salvation is already won in Jesus. We're still here because He wants more people in His kingdom. He wants to call more people like you and me out of the world and into this new world. He wants to make more people into this new creation, this child of God, fully redeemed by the blood of Christ. My fellow heavenly citizens, a people in the world but not of the world, we're still here. And God will sustain you and me through the gifts of his word and his sacraments as he brings us the Holy Spirit in the midst of of our struggles and trials and the tensions of this sinful and fallen world. And while we remain here in the world but not of it, God is sending us, Jesus is sending us. Christ has called each one of you to where you are right now in your life through your vocation, whether it's your family vocation, your work vocation, here in this Christian community for this purpose to share this message of freedom and liberation through the death and resurrection of Jesus. At times, it's going to be tough. As he says in here, Jesus knows what he's talking about when he says, the world is going to hate you. Maybe you've already experienced that. But, take heart. You're not alone. And the one who prays for you in the gospel reading today, here's what the Bible says about him and his conflict with the world. It says, take heart. He has overcome the world. The victory is his already. And he's praying to the Father on your behalf to guard and protect you as he sends you out to share the wondrous news. So I share that with you today. You are loved by God. Despite what happened this past week, you heard the gracious words, your sins are forgiven, and you have eternal life in Jesus. In his name, amen.
May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in this very promise. The promise that you have been fully redeemed in Jesus whilst living in the tensions of this world until he comes again to make everything new and the tension is gone and we are living in the world prepared for us, the kingdom of God. Amen. Please rise. After